So the other day I was looking around at my local used electronics store and I was going through their bin of old remote controls because sometimes you just find weird stuff in there. And well, I did find something weird. This remote appears to go to something called a boy fun. My boy. Here comes that boy. Shit water. It's about the silliest name I've seen on something of this sort. So I was going to buy it as a gag just to show to friends and LOL at. But then I walked around the back side of the table and it turned out they had the boy fun. Now, I'd like to preface this by saying that uh, I used to think it was funny to make fun of how Asian words transliterated into English in unexpected ways, but nowadays I think that's pretty gauche. Uh, a lot of the time you're making fun of somebody's name, etc., so I don't do that so much anymore. But I don't think we need to worry about this one, because this thing is a six letter. That's a word I came up with to describe all the sludge that you find on like Amazon, AliExpress, Timu, etc. that has completely meaningless names. They're between six and eight letters usually, and sometimes they sort of look like words, other times they're clearly just total nonsense, and it doesn't matter because they're not meant to mean anything. These words only exist in order to be registered as trademarks, and this is because uh, something like I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, Amazon started this brand registry program where you get benefits as a seller if your product has a registered US trademark. Now, obviously this was supposed to stem the tide of sludge flooding into Amazon, but what it actually did, predictably, is resulted in a avalanche of automated trademark registrations. I mean, I'm assuming they're automated. I haven't seen any proof of this, but I mean, do we really think that a person is sitting down and coming up with these gibberish names? I mean, why bother at that point? Just have a script that generates random strings of letters or, or phonemes and then simultaneously emails the USPTO, the Amazon brand registry, and the factory that makes the stuff. I'd be shocked if it didn't work that way, so my guess is that nobody at whatever this company may have been ever saw this name except maybe the person assembling it. And frankly, they're lucky that the computer didn't pick worse words out of the hat. I mean... It does happen. So, besides the silly name, what exactly is this thing? Well, it's funny. If you watched my last video, Quick Start Guide N Episode 2, I was just quipping in there about how I'll go to the thrift stores around here and I'll see things that look like laptops, but they just turn out to be portable DVD players. So, yeah, that's what this is. And I wasn't going to buy it at first, I mean, despite the funny name, uh, but then I got to thinking about it and I realized there are a few properties about this that make it interesting to me. For one thing, it's absolutely enormous. Most portable DVD players I see are like six, seven inches, something like that. And I actually found out that even that's big. Like the early ones from like 1998 when portable DVD players first became available, they were like five inches on the outside. And then once you opened them, the screen ended up being like three or four inches across. I'm kind of amazed anybody ever watched a movie on one of those. But this one is 15 inches, or, or, well, I think the display itself might be like 14. Where's my tape measure? I had a tape measure here. No, that really is genuinely 15 inches. So that's the biggest display I've ever seen on one of these things. Like, to give you an idea, this is a Dell Latitude D620, a pretty reasonable business laptop from like 2005, 2006, and it's kind of dwarfed by this thing. You know what, though? Dwarfed is kind of an overstatement. Hang on. There we go. This latitude is absolutely dwarfed by it. Now, did I need to do that comparison? No, absolutely not. But it did give me an opportunity to point out that this is called a D420, and that's the weed number. And really, the screen size is the most luxurious thing about it. I mean, this is the cheapest DVD player I've ever seen. It's like $75 brand new on Amazon. It doesn't weigh anything. But the screen size alone actually makes it kind of appealing if you have a use for this sort of thing. So I'll show you briefly how it performs and then we'll get to the stuff that I'm interested in. So I'm gonna plug this in, but it actually does have its own built-in battery and that is something that'll come up later. But notice that uh, even though it's plugged in and getting power, it doesn't turn on because this thing actually has a physical sliding power switch. You turn it on and it's on, but if you turn it off, it's immediately off. These should be required by law. So right off the bat, you'll notice the problem with this huge screen. It's glossy. And that means that if you were thinking of using your portable DVD player outside, don't. I mean, on top of that, the off-axis viewing is just atrocious. If it's not absolutely dead center vertically and horizontally, you just get horrible bleed and color inversion. This is no kind of IPS display, okay? 
if you're not sitting dead center to it, it's pretty much useless. So the images on Boyfun's website that show the whole family enjoying it, well, those are lies. But honestly, if you're just intending to use this by yourself, I think it's probably fine. It looks pretty good when it's, you know, in use. So let's do that. When I first shot this video, I used Whisper of the Heart as my demo, and it got blocked by Studio Ghibli like within seconds. So instead, I made my own DVD. I'm sorry to disappoint you all, but this is not heralding a physical release. Maybe someday. Back in 2007, the computer industry had a problem. Or more accurately, they had two of them. But only one was somebody else's fault, and both had the same effect. And that was, computers booted really, really slowly. Now, I should say, this actually looks a lot different in real life than it does on camera. This is sort of the hell of attempting to demonstrate audio or video gear on YouTube. For some reason, the camera sees the screen as much bluer than it actually is. Like, I just went and looked at the footage I shot, and there's just this blue haze across everything that isn't there in real life. Like, to my eyes, this actually looks clear, crisp, uh, fairly color accurate. I I'm perfectly fine with it. I would watch a movie on this. It does have really high black levels, and the camera also isn't showing you that. It's like super gray out here. But again, that doesn't really bother me personally, so I actually think this looks perfectly fine, as long as you're sitting dead center to the screen. But of course, there is one problem. We're both letterboxed and pillarboxed, and this is a 16.9 video on a 16.9 screen, so what's going on there? Now, I thought that DVDs had their aspect ratio encoded directly into them, and maybe they do, but if so, this thing doesn't auto-detect it. And you'd think there'd be a button for just quickly fixing that, like an aspect or a ratio button, uh, but there isn't. There is a zoom button on the remote, but what that does is it just zooms the picture within that cropped area, so that's useless. What you actually have to do is to go into the setup menu, go to TV display, there's options here for pan and scan and letterbox, I don't know what those do, they don't seem to do anything. Instead you pick wide, and that makes it tall. To finish, you then have to go over to the panel quality setup. This is where you define your brightness, saturation, etc. Why you would need to tweak those on a panel that's built into the device is anyone's guess. They should be calibrated from the factory, but if we go to aspect ratio, set this to 16.9, then combined with the other setting, it looks as it should. So anyway, with this set up correctly, like I said, it looks pretty good. I wouldn't mind watching a movie on this. It actually looks better in real life than it does on the camera, like even with this tilted down, you aren't really getting the right contrast picture. It's more than tolerable if you're sitting right in front of it, okay? The speakers, as you heard, uh, are not the hottest. Uh, they're kind of tinny and they don't get very loud, but they're serviceable. Now, of course, much of the rest of this is incredibly cheap, uh, and that leads to some funny issues. Uh, for instance, you've got volume up and down here, but the M button, which you'd think would be mute, that's actually how you access your screen controls, brightness, contrast, etc. Why would you have that in the middle of the volume control? I'd guess because the person designing this and the person designing that didn't ever talk to each other. There's also no play pause button. Instead, you just have to hit the OK in the middle of the D-pad. And you'll notice that, that doesn't do anything at first. Even though it's clicking, it's not doing anything. Now, I thought that might be because the, the clicky part of the switch wasn't actually the switch and you had to press down harder to activate it. But no, you just have to hold it down for a fraction of a second. This is too fast. You have to hold it down just that long and then it'll go through. So the processor in this thing is scanning the buttons really, really, really slowly. Another thing I like is that the latch for the door just sort of jiggles up and down in the slot and opens at the slightest touch. And there's no braking mechanism, so you could just reach in and touch your disc, spinning at full speed and potentially damage it. So yeah, it's incredibly cheap, but there can be advantages to that. For instance, uh, pretty much every one of these things supports a screen rotation feature where you can swivel this around and now you don't have to have the base sticking out in front. You can also fold this all the way down and that makes it very convenient for viewing like in your lap, in a car, that sort of thing. But like I said, that's universal to all of these things. What I don't think that all of these could do is to turn it 90 degrees in the other direction. I mean, I don't know, maybe this is common, but at any rate, it is extremely funny. I mean, What's the function of this? What would be the situation where you would need to use the screen at a 90 degree angle to the base, but you couldn't just turn it the other direction or turn it all the way around? I don't know, but I think I figured it out. You see, this is not necessarily useful, but this is. Now I can hear you saying, Gravis, what the hell are you talking about? That's an incredibly stupid idea. Who would ever use this that way? 
But I'm sorry, you lack imagination. This is a game changer for the person who wants to watch a movie while walking. Up until now, you'd have to carry your DVD player with both hands, like a hamburger. But with this, you can simply tuck it into the crook of your arm, and now you can carry it with one hand in the correct landscape orientation as the filmmaker intended while doing something with your other hand, like doom scrolling on your phone. In fact, you can even bend the screen down for the optimal viewing angle. This right here, this is the future of cinema. So jokes and gags aside, I don't think a lot of thought went into this thing, but it didn't really need to, right? For $75, we're not expecting a masterpiece, and I didn't buy it for any of those features anyway. As noted, I really don't need a portable DVD player. But there are several other things that I do need, which I think this can deliver on. Along the side, we've got a bunch of ins and outs that are pretty common for these things. The USB and SD card ports will let you put files into it and play them directly instead of using a disc. There's also this game port over here, and I'm pretty sure you're supposed to be able to plug like a, an Xbox controller in there or something and use it to control the DVD playback, but I haven't been able to get anything to work. What I'm really interested in are these AV out and AV in jacks. If I'm like out in the field shooting video with an old camcorder, which I don't do all that often, but it does happen, then I need some kind of confidence monitor. I need something I can plug into the camera to see what it's outputting without having to stare at the tiny viewfinder or the little LCD screen. Well, this can do that, and I'll demonstrate using Chekhov's camcorder here. Most old camcorders have some way to get composite video out of them, and if you're lucky, then yours will actually have RCAs on it, although this thing doesn't, so what you need is one of these cables here. And I'll just mention that these can be kind of inconvenient because you never know how they're wired. A lot of old camcorders used this kind of plug to get video in or out, and you'd have ground on the bottom ring here, and then video on the next ring, and then left and right audio on the remaining ring and tip. But sometimes they'd be swapped around. It'd be ground, left audio, right audio, video, right? There was no standard for it. It was just a de facto thing. But the ground was always on the bottom. So maybe it would swap your plugs around, but it would still be usable. Well, when Apple released the video iPod sometime in the 2000s, they decided to use a cable just like this, except the video is on the base, and then the ground is on the second ring. And that means that there's no way to swap these plugs around to make it work because video is on the shield here. Now, what I've been told is that Raspberry Pis adopted the iPod video style pinout, so any cable that works for one of those should work. But of course, it's never labeled, so you just have to own both of them and try each one until you find one that works. Irritating. So if I put this in AV in mode, turn my camera on. All right, we got a picture on the camera there, but if I plug the yellow into the yellow, we get this horrible 60 hertz hum because it's interpreting the video as an audio signal. For this particular cable, the video ended up on the red plug. So this actually doesn't look half bad if you compare to the LCD on the camera. It's mirrored because the camera does that, but it actually looks pretty good and it's 60 FPS. There's no like weird deinterlacing artifacts or anything. So I would consider this perfectly adequate for any sort of field monitoring application, especially since as noted, it runs off battery. So I don't need to find anywhere to plug it in. So for this purpose, it works absolutely perfectly, and I think it'll be a useful tool in my repertoire. I mean, the fact that I can have a composite monitor that I could just walk around and hold in one hand is pretty neat. That's not a thing that I had before. And now that I think about it, for $75, I don't really know of anything else you could buy that, that delivers this. I mean, with the built-in battery and everything. So if you're doing anything with composite video, you might actually wanna buy one of these. Just ignore the DVD part completely. Okay, so that's terrific, but what about the AV out feature? Well, that's useful too. If I'm doing a video about a piece of video gear, a, a video switcher, an effects processor, a PC with a capture card, something like that, I need a source of composite video. And I don't wanna just use a camera because then I've gotta point it at myself and worry about how it's framed and whether it's in focus and whatnot. And I could plug in a VCR, but you know, the tape is eventually gonna run out and I'm not gonna notice that and rewind it and hit play. So it's just gonna be sitting there dead for half the video. This has happened before. Not to mention the fact that you're putting extra hours on the mechanism and that sucks. So what I really want is a digital source of analog video and this can do that. If we pop this over to the AV out jack and then put our camcorder in VCR mode, there's the picture. And this will output whatever's on the screen, so we could use a DVD, like yay. But like I said, I'd prefer to use a solid state input, like a USB or SD card. So I've got one of those here. 
it gives us this little file browser interface and here's all the files it thinks it can read. If we go in and pick uh, this file here, and there it is. The composite output looks pretty damn good and there is a repeat feature. So this will do exactly what I want. Uh, I can use this as a continuous source of analog video. There's no fans, there's no parts to fail. It can run it off wall current or off its internal battery so I don't need to plug it in. It'll just output composite video all day long forever. But there's a problem. Notice I skipped over all these files to get down to that one. Uh, why didn't I play the cat video? We all love cat videos. Well, let's give that a shot. Hmm. Unless James Burke has a cat fursona, this is not the video I intended. I've got cat, I've got house MD, I've got a fistful of dollars, and these are MP4, MUV, and I think AVI, and they're all H.264, and it just skipped over all of them and played the first one that doesn't have a question mark icon. So what's all that about? Well, here's the thing. This is a very, very, very old video rip, which, which I made myself from a DVD I owned. This is my backup copy. This video was probably encoded in like 2004, 2005, when the most popular video codec was MPEG-4. But I'm not talking about MP4, the container format that we still use today. I mean MPEG-4 Visual, the codec from like 1998 that was all the rage for a while until it got replaced by H.264. Now, most of us only knew this under the names WMV or DIVX, and I figure if you're under like I don't know, 25 years old. You've probably never heard of either one. And that's good because they sucked. And we switched to H.264 as soon as it became available, pretty much overnight. Everything switched to it. Virtually every piece of random AliExpress crap has been able to play H.264 for well over 10 years, which says really disturbing things about what might be inside this device if it can't. For more deeply disturbing implications, let's try and view a picture. So this one does okay. I mean, it doesn't look very good, but it's also a really, really old digital photo. So it only takes a moment to appear, uh, but you'll notice that I hit pause immediately. That's because as soon as you pick a JPEG, this goes into a slideshow mode that's really, really fast. Like it advances to the next picture in about a half a second. It's useless. And you'd think there'd be a way to adjust that, but there isn't. I've gone through the entire setup menu and there's nothing in here that even mentions that slideshow feature. So that's silly and inconvenient, but it gets a lot worse if we look at a JPEG that's not from 1998. We're loading. We're still loading. We're still loading. And there it is. Now, you might be thinking that this is some terapixel image, like I took a, a 50 megapixel JPEG out of my phone and fed it in here. No, no, this is a 384 kilobyte JPEG. It's like 1102 by 860. This thing just struggles to load it. And if we advance to another picture here, every picture just takes so long to load. Okay, here we go. So this is a picture that I took on my phone. It is fairly high resolution. And if we zoom in here, you can see that the fidelity is incredibly low. It's very clearly being imported into a really low resolution buffer. If we put this next to the original photo, you can see that uh, this text that should say caution is just utterly illegible. Like I said, these are still being actively sold on Amazon and Boyfund's website is only a couple years old. It was only registered in 2018 and archive.org says there wasn't a site there until 2020. So this was made sometime within the last four years and yet it doesn't support any codec newer than MPEG-4, and it takes 10 seconds to display a low-resolution JPEG. But let's put another thing on the pile that it can't do very well. I'm in the middle of editing right now, and I showed my footage to some people, and a couple of them recognized that this port layout is actually quite common in other super cheap, like, AliExpress DVD players. And so they actually knew what this game port was for. It is not at all what I thought it was. I've put some new files on this drive. Let's go get one of them. Here we go. So yeah, uh, it probably goes without saying, but those were not videos, those were NES ROMs, and this thing cannot run them very well. 
Even if you're not much of a gamer, you can probably tell that these games aren't running nearly as fast as they should be. They're obviously running in an emulator that's very CPU starved. They look completely unplayable, not that I can prove that, however, because I don't have a controller that works with this. I had assumed that that game port would work with, you know, any old USB game controller, maybe an Xbox 360 pad, something like that, but everything I've plugged in there doesn't work, and I've started to think that it might be proprietary. Uh, that seems kind of silly with, like, a, a generic six-letter device, but hear me out. Like I said, uh, this particular DVD controller board is used in hundreds or thousands of different devices, going back a long, long time, as, as we'll address at the end of the video. And I think that that port is not actually USB, but is in fact like an NES controller or something like that, that's just using the USB plug because it's convenient. Because I've actually seen these DVD players with built-in NES emulators before, I just forgot that I'd seen them, and they all use the exact same controller. And it is truly horrible. I've actually handled one of these before. Uh, it's got like rubber buttons. It just feels terrible. So of course, I always threw them away whenever I came across one. <laughs> and naturally, I wish I hadn't now. Not that it would make any difference, right? Because this is pretty clearly unplayably slow. I don't think I'm missing much. Okay, so it can't play videos well, can't display images well, can't play video games well. What can it do? Well, other than play DVDs, it can at least play MP3s. Although, I didn't feel like going and digging up some royalty-free music, so I just grabbed something off my hard drive that wouldn't get content ID'd, and for some reason, it was this. I'm sorry to hear that humanity has faced such a catastrophic event in regards to hotwiring a car. It's important to understand that the process may vary depending on the make and model of the vehicle. Your guess is as good as mine as to why I had that file or where it came from, but at any rate, this thing plays MP3s just fine. There's no severe delays or anything like that. It even has that little animated spectrum analyzer. I love that. I wish it were full screen, but I'm not going to complain. This thing struggles with every format that it claims to support, but there's one more you haven't seen yet that it does even worse at, and that's actually text files. I have no idea why this can display text files. I, I mean, I'm for it, right? Like everything with a CPU should be able to do this, but it's, what were they imagining people doing? I guess it doesn't matter because it doesn't actually work. If you pull it up, like, well, that's obviously hosed. This is clearly trying to draw a box around the text, but it's offset from the left incorrectly, so the right side's just being lost, and then some of the text is actually wrapping around and being drawn on the left side, but it's not even being drawn correctly, because, see, if you scroll, you can see that there's bits of old and new text all being mixed together, so this isn't actually being blanked. Clearly, this doesn't work, right? This is an unfinished feature that, that never functioned, and it's bizarre that it's even in here, right? If it didn't work, you'd think they'd have just turned it off, or you'd think they just wouldn't have developed it in the first place, but that's not actually what's interesting. What's interesting is the icon. That icon is, to my eyes, just an inverted version of the Windows TrueType font icon. I mean, it's not quite right. Like, if you invert that, you get a different set of colors entirely, but I'm pretty sure that somebody just reached into the Windows folder and pulled out that icon because they wanted something that vaguely represented text uh, and then did something to it, like ran the Photoshop find edges filter or whatever, and then, you know, shoved it into the firmware. And this is not shocking in itself. I have seen this done many times with super cheap electronics. They'll just rip off images, usually from Windows XP. This is actually surprisingly outdated. So there would be nothing remarkable about this at all, except that we've seen it before. In the video I mentioned earlier, Quick Start Guide N Episode 2, when I was showing off the Averitec laptop that had the built-in DVD player chip, somebody pointed out in the comments that if you look in the OSD, sure enough, there's a ripped Windows 95 TrueType font icon. Now, it wouldn't be shocking at all to learn that this had counterfeit electronics in it uh, made by somebody who, who doesn't care about ripping off files straight out of Windows, but for both devices to have ripped off the exact same icon, instead of going with, like, the text file icon, which you'd think would be more recognizable than the technically incorrect font one, that feels too coincidental, right? And it makes you wonder. In the Averitech video, I talked about how the chip that was in that laptop was literally meant to go in devices like this. And its function was to be the cheapest possible way to bring a device like this into existence. It's just a fully integrated chip that does absolutely everything you need. Talks to the drive, talks to the screen, talks to your audio hardware, everything. 
So wouldn't it be funny if, you know, a day after publishing that video, I walked into a store and found another device that used the exact same chip? Well, I took a look in there to find out if that were the case, and minor spoiler, it's not. But it also kind of sort of is. So I'm going to take this apart again on camera, show you what's in there, and then I'll tell you the punchline. This thing comes apart super easy. Just spin out all the screws. Now, unsurprisingly, this is the kind of device where uh, if you separate the two halves without thinking too hard, uh, you can completely destroy it. So <laughs> let's make sure there's no disc in there. Okay, good. And then if you just try and pop the bottom off, you'll tear all the cables apart. So you have to carefully lift the top up here. Oop, already broke something. And then flip that over like that and disconnect that lead. And now we can lay it down. What was this? This was the IR window up here. Actually not entirely sure what was holding that in. Oh, I see. There's three little stakes there. And they match up with the little tiny holes in the plastic here. Wow. Those did not do a very good job. Oh, got it. Terrific. So this is built pretty much exactly like you'd expect. Uh, the bottom is an absolute featherweight. It's clearly mostly air. All the actual mass of this thing is just in that LCD panel surprising nobody flying leads everywhere almost no cable management stuff just taped down and if you were to gently pull on any of these you'd just rip a connector right off the board i'm sure but hey you're not supposed to take it apart the cd-rom mechanism here obviously bought from somebody else sits on these little silicone supports here so it's not actually held in by anything i mean they probably could have put a screw through one or three of these but that would have cost money, so they didn't. There's just uh, matching plastic pegs on the top here, uh, which means that as you're taking it apart, this whole mechanism can just fall out. Terrific. I'm also a really big fan of what they did with the LEDs. This is a level of cost cutting that's kind of new to me. They've just left the legs on these LEDs untrimmed uh, and then just bent them down at the end, soldered them into the board, and then slid heat shrink over them so the leads don't bridge together when the thing vibrates. And that's it. There's there's no like matching hole in the casting that the other end of the LED slots into. They just sort of um, they just sort of lay here, and that's it. Uh, the best thing they did was you know bend the IR receiver up a little bit so we can see through the window. Uh, but what I find really entertaining here is instead of casting some kind of boss into the bottom shell to hold these at the right level, which, to be clear, is essentially free. They're already making the rest of the plastic casting, right? So what would it have cost them to have a couple little little bosses like this just to hold those up? They've instead just used a, a like a sticky back piece of foam to hold them at the right level. And that's good enough. The window in the front isn't even labeled, so I guess it doesn't really matter where they are, left to right. And this saved, you know, three or four seconds of assembly time, so that's good enough. And hey, you know, at least they bothered to, like, glue in the terrible speakers. And I don't know why this is exactly, but they've actually silkscreened these PCBs, indicating where you're supposed to put the screws, I guess. It's kind of a weird depiction of a screw if so, but Sony does this. They, they indicate uh, every single screw on the chassis of their device that you need to take out to get the thing open, uh, which is handy for taking it apart. I'm not really sure what this is supposed to indicate. I guess it's for the assembly person to tell them not to put a screw there, <laughs> I suppose. And they've actually bothered to label the pins on the connectors. So yeah, a little more effort than you'd necessarily expect for something this cheap. And one other thing they didn't, strictly speaking, need to do is they actually put some fish paper over the battery, which, you know, lithium-ion batteries are little hand grenades that we put in our pockets and carry around with us, so you know, it doesn't make it incredibly safe, but it's a little safer than it absolutely needed to be, especially because there's a decent amount of power down there. I, I don't want to try and get this off because I, I started trying to peel it and it just starts falling apart. And I don't think these are going to be labeled. And if they are, they won't be labeled honestly. So I don't know what the capacity of these battery packs is, but they're about yay big. And there's two of them. There's at least twice as much volume to those packs as there is in like a typical smartphone battery. And if those are like, what, uh, six to eight amp hours, then there's probably... Eh, 10 to 15 amp hours here if these are at all reasonable battery packs 
And given that your typical like DVD player SOC pulls like a watt, other than the backlight and the motor and the drive, there's not a lot of power consumption in here. So it's very possible this thing would run for just hours and hours and hours on a charge. Now to that end, I have no idea if that's true because there's no indication in the on-screen display of the battery charge status of this device. You'd think that it would show a battery icon on the menu or it would show you when it's charging. Uh, it doesn't. And I have not managed to run down the battery in this thing yet, so I don't know what happens when it runs out of juice, but my guess is it just turns off. And I'm guessing that because I don't think they went with a DVD player chip that knows that it's in a portable device. Like I said earlier, this is not using an ESS video drive. It has a MediaTek MT1389VDU, a completely different chip from a completely different company. At least in theory, but we'll come back to that. It is at least the same kind of thing. It's a single chip DVD player solution. Does, you know, decoding and display in all these different formats and handles audio and the whole nine yards. All you have to do is give it a couple support chips and bam, you got yourself a DVD player. Now, I don't know what the VDU suffix means. I looked this up and there were a whole bunch of variants, among them a portable version, the MT1389P. So presumably that would have like the battery charge level meter that I was talking about. But for all I know, the VDU rolls all those variants into one. That's not uncommon. So maybe this supports it. They just didn't bother turning it on. What I can tell you is that this chip is potentially very, very old. The MT1389 datasheet is stamped 2006, and while I don't know if this one's newer than that, honestly, I'd be surprised if anybody was really working on DVD player chips after that point in time, because Blu-ray had just come out. And while that didn't immediately halt all sales of DVD players, I mean, duh, I figured that most R&D work probably pivoted to the new technology, because if somebody was expecting new features, they wouldn't be buying a DVD player, right? At least that's how I think the manufacturers would have seen it. So this chip is potentially 18 years old, and I wouldn't be surprised to learn that it was literally sitting in a drum of chips in like the Shenzhen Electronics Mall for pretty much that whole time. Either that or it's just been in continuous production for nearly 20 years. Neither one would surprise me too much. So this chip is probably very old, and that would explain why this thing is so dog slow. It does have a CPU in there, and I don't have any specs on it. The datasheet doesn't talk about it really at all, other than to suggest that it's 32-bit risk. So it's probably an ARM core from 2006 that was, you know, a few pennies at the time to manufacture. I'm going to guess that it's like... 150 megahertz, something like that. Not very impressive by the standards of any time. So that's obviously why the menus and image loading and whatnot is so dog slow. The only part of this that's efficient is the stuff that's being offloaded to the dedicated decoding cores. The datasheet's very proud of its MPEG-4 capabilities and its USB 2.0 capabilities and the other state-of-the-art technologies, but I don't think they had a dedicated JPEG core on there. But how about that NES mode? I mean, that was super slow too, but could it really be running on the MediaTek chip, like on the DVD decoder? Well, I don't really have any other explanation because there's nowhere else it could really live. Like, there's certainly a lot of devices uh, made over the last couple decades that have had an NES clone chip, uh, also called a, a Famiclone, tucked into a corner somewhere. And theoretically, they could have put one of those on here. And then when you load a ROM, it just like switches the video input over to that or whatever. But, well, they didn't. I mean, you can tell they didn't because it runs like crap, right? If it was a Famiclone, it would not necessarily be a perfect simulation of an NES, but it would at least run at the right speed. This is clearly running on a processor somewhere, and the only one I can find is in the MediaTek. I've identified pretty much all the chips on here. This guy is an audio amplifier. Uh, this is a bunch of power circuitry, including the battery charge controller right there. Uh, down here, you've got an LVDS driver. That's for controlling the LCD. This guy I can't identify without peeling off the sticker, and I was messing it up trying to do that, but I'm pretty positive from the outline and the position that it's SD RAM because the MediaTek chip requires RAM, and there's no other chips on here that could be doing that. Uh, then this is kind of interesting. I don't know shit about any of this stuff, but I was kind of surprised to find that this is a motor spindle controller for the DVD-ROM mechanism. I had assumed it would all be integrated into one package. You know, you would just give it like power and serial control signals and it would spit out data. But apparently, no, I, I guess a couple of these wires down here must go to the motor spindle and then it gets controlled by a chip the vendor provides. 
that's probably normal, but it just seemed weird to me. Uh, and then there's a NOR flash chip over here. That's uh, presumably where the firmware for the MediaTek lives. And that's it. That's that's everything. Uh, the whole device is just those chips. There's nothing else on here with a processor. I'm going to flip this over and show you the back side of the board just to, to be clear. There's nothing back here other than traces and test points. And actually a whole bunch of labels. Again, this is labeled much better than I expected. Uh, everything here uh, from the DC input, the LCD, um, I think backlight output, uh, the composite input and output, and then a whole bunch of signals for, I think, the, the DVD-ROM as well as the LED pins. Everything is labeled. And presumably the test points are for automated testing, but the labels must be for human eyes, right? So this was actually designed with the notion that a person might actually sit down and try and troubleshoot it. And that's kind of wild to me. You'd think this kind of board is being churned out by the millions specifically for, for this kind of device. And thus, you know, the expectation is they're going to test one during manufacturing. If it doesn't work, they're just going to throw it away, right? Who's going to bother to come back with an oscilloscope or a multimeter and, and poke at things, right? Like, by the time you've had a human being lay a hand on this thing, you've already lost money on it, right? So I have to assume that whoever designed this board was actually trying to do, you know, a good job, which is kind of shocking with this sort of uh, hyper cheap electronics. But to go back to the NES for a moment, I'm kind of curious how that emulator got in there, as it were. There's no information in the data sheet for the MT-1389 about programming it yourself, about providing your own software. It barely even mentions that there's a CPU. There's, there's no description of its capabilities, you know, bus width, nothing. So it, it kind of feels like maybe these things just came with firmware and you just used it. So maybe MediaTek actually built in that NES feature themselves. I don't know, but... Let's talk about MediaTek and firmware for a moment. Going back to the mystery of the TrueType font icon, is there a connection between ESS and MediaTek? Yes, and a really weird one, because in 2003, ESS sued them for stealing, apparently, their firmware. It's not clear to me whether it's just, like, the UI or if it was actually the whole firmware, but I suspect it was because uh, they actually succeeded. They settled, they got $45 million from MediaTek, and in return, they granted them a, a license to continue using their firmware on their devices. So it seems to follow, then, that the MediaTek chips, at least at some point, must have been clones of the video drive because they were using the video drive firmware. And that makes me wonder if ESS stole the true type font icon to begin with and then MediaTek stole it from them. I mean, it's entirely possible that neither company was responsible. MediaTek may not have developed the final UI for this thing. Maybe whoever assembled this board customized the firmware and that's when they injected it. And maybe the same thing happened uh, with whoever MSI bought the firmware from uh, for the Averitech laptop because I'm sure they didn't develop it themselves. This could still be a total coincidence. Virtually everybody has that file lurking on their computer, and it's so easy to just grab that instead of finding a source for legal stock imagery. But it was still amusing to find out that this connection existed. I mean, not as amusing as the name of the final product, but what can you do? So that's the end of the video, and I'm really glad because this was such a slog to put together. I was not planning on there being any real narrative to this. I just, I thought the name of the thing was funny, and the video input was neat and I had a couple jokes about like the weird firmware and that was it and then like a few minutes before I started shooting I found out about the stolen firmware business and I'm like well I gotta work that in and then over the course of shooting and editing I just kept learning new things about it and having to go back and shoot new sequences to insert uh and the result to me just feels like this bizarre patchwork quilt of disjointed clips and I hope it doesn't feel that way to you <laughs> But uh, hopefully you enjoyed yourself, and if you did, uh, it'd be cool if you could subscribe uh, to let me know I didn't didn't screw up too bad. Uh, but if you really want to help me out, then consider supporting me on Patreon like these people are doing, because without them, I couldn't do any of this. I mean, this is my full-time job, so I couldn't, like, you know, buy groceries or put gas in my car or anything. Uh, but in addition, I wouldn't be able to buy, you know, weird stuff like this. This was like 50 bucks, and I had no idea if there was going to be anything to it uh but fortunately uh my supporters have put their faith in me to just buy things and find out if there's something to say about them and it works out far more often than i would expect so i want to thank all my patrons for believing in me i'm incredibly grateful and everyone else thanks for watching